states of ongoing sessions. And if there isn't a match, then this is a new session. Um, then we bring in this context. We say, what is the session up to? Oh, it's a Ghostwriter IP channel. Has it opened the video um, um, channel? Uh, what is it trying to do? At which state is it? And at some point, you know what to do with the session. And then you can treat the session it's in its entirety, one way or another. Um, and again, we'll talk about this a little bit more, but it's, it's a different architecture. It's uh, a lot of state and memory management. Um, and um, it's very programmable. Otherwise, it's almost impossible to keep up with um, applications that um, get introduced almost daily. Um, and then the last is the business model. And uh, part of the, the deal here is to try and move from just a flat, basic um, entrance fee and everything else is all you can eat to probably, at least on wireline, uh, still a flat fee, but then some differentiation. And I'll give some examples. Um, SLAs, um, again, often the SLA, SLA is a service level agreement, but service here is actually transport. You measure latency, you measure uptime. You don't measure how good your voice connection was or how much actual content were you able to, to get. Um, so that's going to be, become more granular um, and more accurate if you want to create a richer business model. Question? Yep. You talk about the service elements being non-programmable. Obviously, a lot of these network devices, you know, kind of software, in fact, there's hardly any hardware left. Everything right down to the chip level is programmable. So to what, to what extent, or can you specify what you mean by non-programmability? Um, the core of the router, for example, or a switch, um, deals with um, a fairly small number of protocols. It could be routing protocols, it could be BGP, it could be a, Whatever it is, those protocols are well defined. They're controlled by standards groups or the ITF. Um, you don't have to turn on support for a new routing feature overnight or over the weekend. Um, in the, the application aware world, um, a new version of peer-to-peer -peer protocols, gaming protocols, uh, instant messaging protocols, um, spontaneously get deployed and become popular literally overnight. So there is no programming environment around the router where you could um, change the uh, core or the insides of the router to be able to do more things. Yeah, this iOS for Cisco, and yeah, the next drop of iOS is nine months down the road, and it will bring in new features. Um, but nine months in our world is eternity. In a packet world, it's not. It's those packet headers don't You're change. not talking about the end user provisioning that. The service provider using these network services <coughs> still has to do a plan upgrade. Um, so the, the provisioning is, is, uh, is a complementary story to this. And again, I'll touch provisioning a little bit. In fact, those slides talk about it a little bit. But um, you always have a set of configurable options and then the provisioning environment can decide whether or not to turn them on or off. Um, but provisioning environment cannot um, create new capabilities in the router. And um, there is no um, programming environment that the ISP can use to create new capabilities in the router. The router is what it is. It's got a lot of software in it, and you can use or not use some of the options that it provides, but that's as far as it goes. Uh, do you do any provisioning templates ahead of time and you enable them as needed? Is that what you do or? Um, so. Okay. Well, you, you're actually, your SLAs are actually based on contracts signed by people instead of just contracts signed. Um, they could be. Yeah. Right, okay. Yeah. But, but um, this is, um, so this is another angle of, of the difficulty of all of this. If you look at um, whether you want to just gain visibility into what your traffic carries. Um, and packet devices, typically, since they only look at packet headers, um, they can tell you what port packets come in on. Um, they can't necessarily tell you what application sessions you're carrying. In, in fact, um, you look at a lot of those peer-to-peer -peer traffic, uh, it's not playing by the rules anymore. Right. So even things as simple as Kazaa Light, it uses port 80. So we, we went into one of the large carriers in Europe um, originally because they said, we have a huge growth of web traffic and we can't figure it out. <laughs> and they said, over oh, 80% of the traffic is web. What, are, what, what is going on? And of course, 60% um, of the traffic was Kazaa Line, <laughs> less than 20% uh, browsing. And that is because if you only look at port 80, um, you, you, 
have come to the wrong conclusion. I may be jumping the gun. Are you going to define anything like a degree of agility? Um, in, in all this that you're talking about, I mean, basically you're talking about an agile network for network management, for provisioning separately and building and mediation and so on. And it, it may be hierarchical in, our, in, in all the features. Uh, are you going to define what is the degree of agility that you need to have? You know, at what what uh, granularity that you, you need to do? Are you going to get into that detail or um, no? So, so part of the technology, and we'll talk about the technology, we've had to come up with our own programming environment. In fact, sure. we've had to come up with our own programming language um, to, to create an abstraction of services over IP. And that is driven by what some of the carriers call uh, service velocity, which is the, the degree of agility, or there's a lot of ways to look at it. Um, but yeah, we just have to talk about the things that we have to be agile for, and then we can talk about um, how or what we do. Yeah, service velocity is only one of the factors for right. agility. Right. Right. Velocity is how quickly you do things rather than agility is what are the different degrees of freedom that you have? Right. That's 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 yeah, more the, the term fundamental. Velocity was, was chosen by this carrier because he said velocity is a combination of speed and direction, and speed <laughs> enough is not not uh, speed enough. Yeah, but there's is more to it. There's degrees of freedom. Right. Right. Yeah. 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 Um, do you try to identify what a packet is about by actually going in and looking at the bytes, maybe doing some statistics uh, analysis on it? Is that what you're doing? Um, Yes, but we do more because in oh. a lot of cases um, we actually um, create an abstraction, uh, abstract definition of what the actual protocol is, and we track it very closely. So we actually follow the protocol, we follow the message exchange um, very accurately. Okay, so you actually look at the bytes in the packet and try to identify what's going on. Absolutely. Yeah. If you look at Primarily large packets that bulk data transfer, wouldn't that be enough? Why would you also have to look at the equivalent of payments or something like that to see the little ones because they don't really add up? Um, most of the uh, interesting stuff actually goes on in the smaller packets. Um, you look at a get command, often that's not huge, but that's where all the interesting information about a web transaction gets encapsulated. Then the rest of it is just data coming at you. But if you miss that one, then all this data coming at you doesn't have any association. So uh, there's, uh, there's a control or signaling plane, and that's the data plane. And a lot of the signaling goes on in, in fairly small packets, which are very important to track. And um, th this is true for most applications. In fact, so um, you're more interested in the smaller packets than you are in the large packets. Um, we're interested in the smaller packets to, to know what's going on, but then for the things that um, the carrier or the, the ISP cares about, um, often we need to track um, all the packets, including the big ones, um, to meter it um, or to shape it or to block it based on what the carrier wants to do. So if, if this is a video streaming session, um, of a particular type and, and um, somebody's paying a dollar extra for it, um, we need to make sure that um, it's shaped correctly, that it's built for correctly, and it's geared so that you know how to build for it. You have to track all those packets. And also you build based on what you do, how you, how you monitor, how you control, and how you enable the customer to use it, rather than just the simple volume. Right, right, okay. right, right, right. right. Okay. Um, yeah. This is built independent of whether the connection is hardwired, wireless, or satellite? Um, so, yes. Um, um, so, again, I'll, I'll talk about this briefly, but um, since we built this as, as, as an intelligent overlay, as opposed to building, a, there was um, a bunch of companies that started around the same time as us, which we internally called the rock boxes. Those were guys who built a router that could switch, could aggregate, could do optical multiplexing, could do services, VPNs. Um, that is a hard proposition. Um, but if you look at only layers four to seven, um, which is IP in, IP out, um, then logically where we typically deploy our technology is behind, at the access points, <coughs> behind uh, the aggregation um, 
point, so that a lot of the uh, all the incoming traffic gets aggregated before it is handed over into the network, which flows through our devices. And now, um, if we go into a cable MSO, there's a CMPS in there. If we go into a DSL deployment, that's a VRAS. If we go into um, a wireless um, network, it'll be a PDSN or a GGSN, or we've done a few of those satellite. Um, um, once it's IP, it's, it's the same language. Um, that makes it. Yeah? Does IP or MSL approve your packet? Yes. Um, encrypted traffic is encrypted. And so, um, and so there are two options. One is um, to um, let it through. The other is to assume <coughs> anything that's encrypted that I don't know of is necessarily not good. And a lot of um, the logic that's being uh, used by ISPs uh, now, probably for the next year or two, it is a logic saying, um, the assumption is everything on, the, on, on our network is good, except for, and we'll tell you what the exceptions are, and you control them. And some forms of peer-to-peer -peer will be an exception, for, for example. Um, over time, we think this logic will be inverted. So at some point, the assumption would be everything's bad. Now let us tell you what's good. And um, whatever's bad is best effort. It doesn't mean you have to kill it. Um, but um, this video business um, is good because we're getting some, something out of it. That gaming traffic is good because, again, it's one of our partners. And this peer-to-peer -peer is content distribution where we get a piece of the of the action and those things you want to make sure really work well and those things um, then can be identified the rest would be best effort including traffic. But we've, we've uh, actually dealt with um, some forms of encrypted traffic fairly successfully um, just by um, looking at signatures and uh, fingerprints. And so now I want to get into the dick. I want to delve into details of the encrypted type of traffic versus non-encrypted type of traffic because the customer may say, you know, I mean, especially a big customer, business customer, a special customer, if you want to call it, they say, I have encrypted traffic. You know, don't look at anything else. You can charge me more money just because right. you don't, because for you not looking at it, you probably want to charge more money for me right. and then do that. that. That special case would be there. Yeah, and, and there's also an in-between uh, model because um, again, if we talk about signaling versus data, um, yeah. I, I think signaling will end up always being in the clear, and the data will end up being encrypted. And um, it's like if you look at a telephony network, signaling is what you dial. Yeah, yeah, you have to. Yeah. Have, has to know where you're dialing to be able to help you and support you. Um, they shouldn't be able to hear your conversation. Yeah. Um, but there are two kinds of signaling. One is the network. Uh, uh, management kind of a, uh, uh, by the network provider, which is different from the end user uh, 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 endpoint level signal. You need um, to, you need to have a different. Uh, yeah, the argument. signaling that we care about is the signaling in the application level. So it's not the kind of okay, signaling okay, that, okay. Uh, You're not talking about that. Okay, right. it's not RSVP or whatever network management level signaling. Okay. Um, that is the mechanics. It's uh, okay. The, the I'm eager to get to get to right. exactly how you implement it. Right, right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Sooner or later, <laughs> sooner or later, we're going to let you talk. <laughs> oh, by the way, do you want to make a presentation? I'm asking 612 <laughs> slides. So, <laughs> <laughs> so, in the previous slide, you were talking, it sounded like you were doing some quality of service determination uh, not based on connection management messages. Is that um, It is true. Um, it's not that we don't look at connection management messages, but we do more. And, and again, I'll, I'll... Okay, so I'd be interested in yeah. as you go through the talk. Right. Uh, <laughs> Why you need more... Carry on. <laughs> uh, so if, you're, if your connection management says, you know, basically says, this is the kind of connection I want. Um, you know, so everything you need to know about how to buy that service is already in the connection. So, so Bill's teenager or, or son or daughter is on the computer uh, downloading um, Nemo, which is a 800 megabyte file. Um, 